Okay. Uh, evening. Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center in Phoenix. It's still uh, too hot to come visit, but it's almost over. We're down the down slide now. And uh, I'll be happy when that happens because the utility bills around here are huge. Frightening. Thank you for your donations, by the way. That was a nice lead in. I got a good Bible study for you tonight. But let's have some fun first, and we will do the announcements. I forgot my clicker tonight. Doggone it. Oh, nuts. I'm going to use the old clicker tonight. It's fading on me. Okay, the next seminar is August uh, 30th. That's a Friday. It's coming up fast. Boy, this year's gone by fast. It's been unbelievable. There's all of our teachings on our YouTube teaching channel. You just go to youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. Boom, they're all there. 400 of them or something. You can watch them all in an afternoon. If you want to help out a little bit with our ministry, Good Search will pay us money. If you switch over from Google, just put in our charity name there. And they pay us when you surf the web. Uh, this is very important to the ministry here. You need to have one of these lists. Uh, they work 100% of the time. I can get about 5 to 10% of the people to actually do it. Some people, it takes them over a year to get it done. So whatever, whatever it is, <laughs> you got to get this list done if you're looking for your destiny from God. And this thing is really helpful. There's our deliverance training class. If you happen to have any interest in the deliverance ministry, 18 classes, it's in the bookstore. American churches have gone to pot. Find out why the seven churches of Revelation is also, the training is also in the bookstore. Monthly prayer group, uh, the fourth Saturday of every month at 11 o'clock. Please come, come pray for the ministry. The devil's sending us a lot of strange stuff. We're getting uh, <clears throat> a lot more sick people here. Yesterday, evidently, there was a gal in the parking lot naked. Uh, we get a lot of people showing up naked. I always refer to those as a Thursday night service for Rick. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't do well with the naked clients. I, I move past that. But anyway, man, it's, uh, we're getting deluged, so we need prayer here. And uh, if you can show up at 11 o'clock Saturday, that would be great. Fourth Saturday of the month right here. Thank you. And after that, you just go into the small sanctuary, and I have a deliverance training class at noon on the fourth Saturday of the month. The donation boxes are on the door. Hey, would you mind uh, shutting these two doors for me? Thank you. <clears throat> The donation boxes are on the doors there. We don't pass a plate here. Thanks for helping us. Particularly during the summer, the utility bills are high. Did I already mention that? <laughs> oh, they're huge. You can donate on the website if you want to, PayPal, or you can download this app on your phone, Tithely, and donate that way. We get a lot of donations from different sources. If you're in your car on Monday through Friday in the morning on the way to work, please tune in to Brother Mike at 7.30 on 10.10 a.m. Christian Radio. I'm also on Saturdays and Sundays in the afternoon. Been on there for 21 years. I'm trying to break my friend's uh, record. Rhonda Buell. He was on <laughs> 10, 10 a.m. for 30 years. I only have nine to go. I can catch him. He's dead now. And uh, if you're on the radio 30 years, you're not going to, you got to die, you know. 30 years is a long time to survive on the radio. But he went home to glory, so I'm trying to catch him. <laughs> I was on his show a couple times. Yeah. He, had a, he had a studio right in his home, real nice one, attached to the church over there on Sunny Slope. Yeah, he was there for decades. Hey, don't forget about our date on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Twitch.tv, that's my podcast every Sunday morning for my shut-ins. YouTubers, please remember, you're to set up an ambush team in your church. 
pick off the six people. You only need two or three people to do it. It works easy. It works fast. You isolate the sick person. You get them delivered and healed. Then you'll have nothing but people lined up to see you. And then what happens to you? You get kicked out. That's right. Don't forget about this Zoom on Wednesday night. Major anointing. Brother Rick, 6 o'clock. You can send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you all the information on the Zooms if you want. Don't forget about Monday's Zoom for the ladies at 6.30. And Saturday's Zoom with Brother Mike is on at 6 o'clock. Okay, so, so it's Monday, Wednesdays, Saturdays. Uh, this is something I'm grateful for. Julie came up with the idea to teach my book I wrote on Christians with Mental Illness, Plan of Spirits. She teaches it on Tuesday nights. You can get the book in the bookstore and join the class. I think it's men and women. <laughs> Shoot. Oh, nuts. It's, okay, it's only women. Okay, Don't you show up. Well, <laughs> Tuesday nights, ladies, Plan of Spirits, training, get the uh, book in the bookstore. There it is, 6.30. Great class. In fact, there's a book right there. Boom. Oh, this thing's not working. All right. Well, it's that one over there. I got a pointer. Genetic. Don't forget about our Thursday and Friday night broadcast. This is one of them. YouTube and Rumble have got them. And then I think Kelly loads us on here afterwards. GodTube. And we're on a new one. Evidently, she's putting us on Odyssey. Odyssey.com at HCC ADC semicolon three. Is that correct? Didn't hear the Lord talking to me there, so let me get off of this one. <clears throat> Let's skip that slide. I'll see you in two days, this Sunday morning, in Miami, not Florida. Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. It was going to be a Sunday evening service, but they booted us up. So we got the main service this Sunday, 11 o'clock. You can't miss it. It's on the main drag. The highway just goes right through the middle of town. And it'll be on your right there. I'll see you there. Okay. All right, training days. I want to teach you a few things tonight about uh, how God handles people. Uh, you remember the story about Elijah, the great prophet, right? Everybody's read this, 1 Kings chapter 19. And he was sitting on a mountain all by his lonesome, and God wanted to talk to him. And he sent him a windstorm, an earthquake, and a firestorm. Remember that? And uh, God was not talking to him in that way. He was talking to him with a what? Still small voice. And there's been a lot of controversy over the years what that still small voice is. But believe it or not, he uses different types of small voices. The most frequent type is what we're going to go over tonight. Let's go to the marriage of Cana first. John chapter 2. The third day... There was a marriage in Cana. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples got an invite. Huh? His mother said to his servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now, why did she do that? Well, uh, they had run out of wine. Now, I'm not sure of this, but my guess is it was Jesus, one of Jesus' sisters. And because Mary was running the whole show. And... Uh, she comes to Jesus and says, hey, we ran out of wine. Okay. Uh, now, Jesus wasn't a wine dealer or a merchandiser. So something else in Mary's mind told her to go to him. Knowing that he had never performed a miracle before. Gives you an idea of the status he had in the community. 
He was, uh, from an intellectual standpoint, a beyond a genius, genetically. And then uh, the Holy Ghost, and then his knowledge of the Word and everything else. Well, he was a, already a famous person in those parts. And so she always ran to him for help. Joseph may have been dead by now. We don't know. But anyway, she tells the servants, which is what God is telling you tonight, whatever the Lord tells you to do, you're supposed to do it. Okay? You're not supposed to sit around and think about it, debate it, discuss it with somebody. If you're told to do something by God, you just do it. The Holy Ghost puts these stories in the Bible for a reason. We'll go over a couple of them here tonight. Now, there's six water pots of stone. They're called hudrias. And uh, the Jews also use these big water pots for water, wine, different things, and for purification ceremonies. And each jar contained two to three firkins. Metrotes is a Greek word for firkins, and that's where we get our old English term meters. And uh, each of them were about nine gallons per firkin. Okay? So, uh, each one of them, it says, contain two to three nine-gallon units per, right? And here, here, here's what they look like. They're made out of pottery, of course. And so that means that each water pot, Udria, each one of them had 18 to 27 gallons. Now that's pretty heavy. That's pretty big. <clears throat> and then, if you... If my math is right, and, and I'm not good at math, <laughs> I, I, um, not, I didn't excel in math in school. <laughs> Did poorly, actually. But uh, after consulting with my wife, she used to be a math teacher, I think these figures are right. This is between somewhere between 108 and 162 gallons of water in these pots. Correct? Anybody here good at math? <laughs> yeah? I think calculus. Calculus, is this right? <laughs> well, uh, <da> <laughs> All right, sir, out. All right, now this has been verified by the Lord through a calculus major. This is, these are figures are accurate. All right, now we're looking at 108 to 162 gallons of water okay so if you've ever had this guy come in that's how many gallons that'll be five gallons right so what we're looking at here this is 30 gallons here on that rack there's six of them there's six of them correct sir and that's a lot that's a, that's not a couple cups so i mean that's a that's a pickup load or something. <clears throat> Jesus said, fill the water pots, fill them all the way up. Rim them out, says here. So there could have been 30 of them. If they did, that's what it looked like. 30 of those five-gallon bottles would have been completely filled, correct? If my math is right. Fill them up to the rim them out. And then he says to the water pot workers, take them out and give them to the Arctitriclinos. What is that? The guy running the wedding. My guess is, and I can't prove it, don't send me an email. I'm guessing this is either Joseph, if he wasn't dead, or it was the... Uh, the groom's dad, but I'm not sure. But anyway, somebody was running the wedding in charge. And then Mother Mary was down here doing all this work in the wedding, and I'm assuming it may have been her daughter. But I'm not sure, and if you disagree, that's okay. But it says, Jesus said, now go give it to the boss, the guy running the whole thing. Correct? <clears throat> 
here's what God's telling you to do, and here's why your ministry hasn't taken off. You haven't filled the water pots to the brim. Okay, you've been going to church for years, and you've got kind of half of it full, but you haven't filled the water pots to the brim. There's a reason these stories are in the Bible. The Holy Ghost doesn't do anything by chance. Puts them in there, and he says, hey, this is what I'm trying to teach you. And they took it out and gave it to him. Then, when the ruler of the feast tasted the water that was made wine, he didn't know where it came from. Okay? He, nobody else did either except the guys on the water pot duty, right? Then it says the servants withdrew the water. They knew what happened. Nobody else did. The governor of the feast, the guy running the whole thing, calls the bridegroom, and he says to him, every man at the beginning of a wedding, or the beginning of something, celebrations or whatever it is, they bring out the good wine. Okay, why were they doing that? Because hmm? everyone was sober and they could tell. Right. <laughs> everyone was sober, so they brought out the good wine and everybody got a buzz. Then after they buzzed out, everybody would bring out the Cheaper wine, the lower grade wine, the, the, the Thunderbird. <laughs> Thank God they didn't have Thunderbird back then. We wouldn't have any Bibles. They brought out the low rent wine at the end. That way no one would notice because they were drunk. They were partially drunk, buzzed, whatever the stage it was just like happy hour or whatever. When, then he says, the governor says, the boss says it, when the men have well drunk, methuo is the Greek word for being, becoming drunk. He says when men have become buzzed or drunk, then that which is worse comes out. That's how they do it. That's how they did it back then. But you kept the best wine in reverse. See that? What God's saying to you is that your Mickey Mouse Christian life has to be reversed. So you can't be like a regular church person or a common run-of-the-mill Christian. You can't, you can't live like that. You can't do that. So you need to reverse it. You can't be like everybody else. This is the beginning of miracles. Arche in the Greek word means the first in line, the first one that happened. Here, that one, and then everything followed that. Arche, okay? Why is that important? Have you ever heard of the Apocrypha? Yeah. So there's a bunch of stories in the Apocrypha about Jesus performing miracles as a kid. One of the stories is he <clears throat> found a this dead bird, prayed over it, boom came back to life. All those stories are fake. That's why they weren't included in the Bible. There are too many fake stories in the Apocrypha. So they dumped it. For good reason. It was just somebody making up like the Globe or the Inquirer. Yeah. They got rid of it. Some of it's valid. First and second Maccabees, that's a great read and there's some good historical information in there. It's a legitimate, you know. But generally speaking, Apocrypha, Let's switch stories here and go to five loaves and two fishes. John, John chapter 6. A great multitude followed Jesus because they saw his miracles, which he did on those who were diseased. Okay. Miracles are not the end all of anything. They're only an advertisement in a way by God to say, hey, this is something unique or different here. Okay, this isn't like a regular religion. Buddhism, Islam, this and that and that. There's hundreds of them. This isn't just religion. This is something supernatural. Look at that. Pooh. And so the people were intrigued by that, and they were following him for obvious reasons. There was a lot of people sick back then. And Jesus went up to a mountain. There he sat with his disciples. 
And the Passover was coming up called the Feast of the Jews. Now, uh, you notice something weird about the Passover. The Greek word is Pascha. It's called something different in the New Testament because it had been so rotted out and corrupted. It was another religious piece of crap. Okay? They're having the Passover and you got all these people sinning like crazy, not following the word of God or nothing. So it had turned into garbage. So, so did the description of it. It went from the Lord's Passover in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers to the Jews' Passover. The feasts of the Lord went, turned into the feast of the Jews. They were rotted out and corrupted. And the commandments of the Lord had turned into just traditions of men. The Jews rotted out everything in the Old Testament. All that was left was stench, corruption, similar to our politicians. Please don't repeat that. John chapter 6 again, Jesus lifted up his eyes, saw all these people coming at him. So he goes to a teaching moment and he's speaking to you in a still small voice. You can teach someone to do something by example. You can get them to observe something and you can teach them something if you can get them to come up with it on their own. Instead of thus saith the Lord all the time, I don't know if you've, any of you are married, but if you talk to your spouse too much, they start to develop blah, 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 a strange illness infects their ears and it's this deafness overcomes them and they don't hear you anymore. You ever notice that? Don't raise your hands. So God knows that if he keeps talking to you, you're, you're going to turn a deaf ear to him. So he's trying to train you by using your own mind, the still small voice in your mind, to catch on to deep spiritual things. And so the Spirit of the Lord put these stories in the Bible so we could learn from their behavior. So he says to Philip, Who's Philip? Philip's a pain in the... Right? Philip has a high IQ. He's very intelligent. His parents were probably very smart. And he was the analytical person of the disciples. He was the thinker. His IQ was really high. And everything that happened, he would process it and over-process it. You know, it was like... It was like he was a calculus teacher. Real high IQ, see? And real high IQ people very often have terrible trouble with miracles, deliverance, healings, because they think too much about spiritual things. If you over-process it, it becomes kind of dead. Childlike faith gets miracles every time. Analytical intelligence of humans buries God's miracle working power. So Philip, Philip is trying to be, God's trying to save Philip because if, if someone with a high IQ develops spiritual sensitivity, they can become monsters for Christ. Monsters. And they accomplish things no one else can do. I myself was blessed with an average IQ. But I got the looks. So that's what. Philip. Now what's he doing there? God's going to test you in your life. And he's going to ask you questions without giving you the answer. Why is he doing that? He wants the still, small voice of your mind to think about spiritual things. How does this work? Mind. 
Philip, what are we going to do? Man, there's five, six, seven thousand people out there. You know, how are we going to feed them? Philip, he didn't ask the other ones. He didn't ask Thomas, did he? No, Thomas was raised in a family where everything was, the glass is half full. It's always half full. You know, it's always, there's always a downer. His mom and dad were naggers. They were uh, critical types. They were, if you told him something, really? I don't know about that. This happened. Can you believe that? No, I really don't. So Thomas always had a genetic desire to doubt spiritual things. He didn't ask Thomas. He knew Thomas didn't believe anything. He asked Philip. Philip was a thinker. What are we going to do about it, Philip? He says, Jesus, so he did that to Perazzo, test him. That's what God's going to do to you. He's going to let you see stuff, and he's going to watch you while you think about it without saying anything. I hope somebody from YouTube's listening to me. God will speak to you in ways that you wouldn't expect. He wants you to use your mind to come to the truth on your own. If you catch it in your mind on your own, you're much more likely to remember it longer. The Holy Ghost, the greatest teacher of all. Am I right? Yes, he is. I'm testing Philip, not, not Thomas, not John, not John. Philip. Why? God only knows what he wants to do with you and what he's going to do with you, but he wants you to catch the wave. He wants you to be a spiritual surfer. You wait for just the right wave, and then you take off. Why doesn't God answer me? Believe it or not, he probably already did, but he did it in a way that you missed with your mind. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Of course, God knows what he wants to do with you, but he wants you to see it yourself. So Philip says, naturally, he comes up with a human solution. He's a calculus major. He goes to the math. Well, 200, 200 denarians, we couldn't even give 6,000 people one little crumb from that. That's all we've got in the bag. Judas pilfered it down to 200 denarii. That's all we got left. Judas had the bag. Remember? He was a thief and he had the bag. Well, there's only 200 denarii left. Denarii were the number one Roman coin in the world. It was the number one coin anywhere in the world. And uh, the average salary for a day's labor was one denarian. That's what it, basically what it was worth, worth on the, commercially back then. Jesus says in John chapter 14, do not let your heart be troubled. The reason your ministry stinks so bad is because Tarasso is a Greek word that means to get agitated. To get agitated, you have to have a negative thought. When you receive negative thought, the demons get your soul involved, and you have a negative emotion that follows it. And so you get an agitation. Agitation generates doubt in the human soul. Calmness and peace generates Assurance and victory. Jesus said, don't be anxious and agitated because you're not going to see all these things I'm teaching you non-verbally. You believe in God, believe also in me. What is this, total blasphemy? Of course it is if you're not a believer because here is a human putting himself at the same level of Jehovah, the Hebrew God. No one compares to the Hebrew God. 
He's at the top. Shockingly. You believe in Jehovah, the eternal God of the Hebrew? Give me the same belief. Can you imagine the level of blasphemy if this wasn't true? Off the chart blasphemy. John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the truth, I am the life. No man can come to God, Jehovah, the Hebrew God. No man can come to the Father except by Greek word dia, through me. Utter blasphemy beyond belief if it's not true. Nobody would dare say that other than a somewhat patient with psychosis or somebody telling the truth. There's, there's not a middle ground there. Is there? No, no, no one would say that. He gets through saying all these things, and Philip, Philip, Philip pops up again. There he is, the guy with the big brain. After Jesus said all that, he then responds with what? We'd like to be content, our kale. Now we need to do one more thing. Show us Jehovah. See, he's the thinker. Faith things come hard to him. Because he's so smart, he overprocesses spiritual things, see? Childlike faith just drives miracles right through the heavens. Anybody can have a miracle with childlike faith. It's easy. You, you said that, Lord? Okay, that's it. See? I don't need to overprocess it or think about it or discuss it with somebody. I don't need any information from you. Father said that. That's it. Period. I'm there. That's childlike faith. Not Philip. Not too, too smart. Ah, nuts. Darn it. Philip, you thinker. Have I been with you this long? What, three, four years? Philip was the first guy called, remember? Then he, then he went and got Andrew, remember that? He, he was there from the very beginning. He was with John the Baptist. Philip, Philip saw everything. He had collated the whole system. He saw the great John the Baptist, history's greatest preacher, baptizing thousands of people in tears, repenting. The guy was a super preacher at a minimum. He saw all that. Then he came over to Christ. Then he went and got his brother. If you've seen me, you've seen Father. <laughs> Utter insane blasphemy unless it's true. No one would ever say that in their right mind unless it was true, would they? Of course not. <clears throat> Why are you asking to see the Father? You've seen me. You don't need to see the Father. Correct? Jesus said, I only speak those things. I hear my Father saying... I only do the things I see my father doing. Therefore, I am the perfect representation of father. Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, John 1. You see me, you, you see God. These are powerful scriptures, if you don't mind my saying. But there's Philip. Oh, man, Philip, you blew it again, man. Oh, Philip, I feel sorry for him. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, hey, there's a, uh, a lad here that has five barley loaves. Back to John 6. And two, smith, two fish. But then, you know, <laughs> Andrew... <laughs> goes with Philip on this when he says, well, you know, what am I talking about? This is stupid. I got a kid with a sack lunch. There's six, 7,000 people standing there. Uh, what, what am I trying to do here? Uh, Andrew may have been trying to puff himself up. Have you ever uh, gone to church and met these people that are, you know, they're different in the parking lot, but soon they walk through the door. It's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> you ever seen those people? 
They make you sick, don't they? Bless your brother. Well, Andrew, Andrew did it. Did it there. He, he tries, to, tries to let the other disciples see that, hey, I'm not a heathen anymore. We got a lad here with sack lunch. I'm not like Philip. And then he dives into Philip. Well, oh, really, what good's that? That ain't going to work. Okay. What's going on here? Jesus is testing these people. He's testing you. God will test you by giving you an, a, a, a problem that appears to be insurmountable. And he'll sit there and watch you and listen to how you're thinking about it. He'll expose you to something that he knows you can't do. And then watch you think about it. Well, he was watching Philip. He watched Andrew. Oh, they failed their test. Okay. Now he goes to the kid. Well, the kid didn't like Philip. The kid's got a regular brain. He just walks up with a sack of lunch. Lord, you need here you go here you go I got childlike faith I, I'm a five year old six year old kid I can generate miracles these, these disciples who are thinkers they get nothing I got a sack of lunch I can give this to God I got this covered wow and a little child will lead them the Bible says Hey, what are them among so many? The kid didn't think that. That was Andrew, the idiot. The kid's on board. He, gives, he offers it. Here, you need a miracle? I got one here. Go. What's God doing there? He's letting you. He's showing you. I'm teaching you. He's watching you right this second as I'm talking to you. What are you thinking about? You see, I got Andrew and Philip. Here, I got a kid with a sack of lunch. Here, what are you thinking about? He's watching you right now, thinking about this story the Holy Ghost put in the Bible to get you to think about where you need to be. Then Jesus says, hey, the kid and the sack of lunch. Now it's time for miracles. Not Philip and Andrew. They were spiritual losers. The kid had childlike faith. Wow. Oh, I got the kid now, the Lord says. Now we can make the men sit down. I got past the church people. I got past the disciples. Now I'm in the miracle zone. I got a six-year-old. My goodness. When they were done feeding all them people, only God knows how many people were there. It says there were 5,000 men. Well, where are the women? Everybody knows there's more women at church than men, so it's got to be over five, right? Everybody knows back then, everybody tried to have as many kids as they could. It was an economic and spiritual asset. There might have been, my God, this thing could have gone 15, 20, right? Well, okay, if you don't believe that, fine, let's stay with five then. That's a lot. And they gathered and they filled 12 basketfuls with the fragments of the five barley loaves. Not the fish. Coffinos, what is that? Those were those little baskets that uh, merchandisers carried, like kind of small suitcases or different things, like small things you traveled with. And they were all made out of different things back then. For example, that one on the left there is like 3,000 years old or something that they found. And that was made out of reeds from the river. Of course, these other ones were made out of papyrus. Other things were made out of, you know, they made them out of different things, obviously. 
But this is the basket we're talking about here. Not a big basket like that, but these were these small baskets that people carried with them when they traveled. Well, they had 12 of them. Uh, they filled up with the bread. What was God telling you to do? Hey, listen, in your ministry, you can't waste anything. You, you can have the biggest miracles in the world, but the little ones are to be kept as well. See, not everything is a giant Red Sea miracle that God wants you to have. Some of it is little things. Put the little things in the little basket. The little things you learn. Not to take an offense. Not to get upset. Not to criticize. Little stuff you learn. Boom, the miracles are great. I'm, 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 I'm big on miracles. I love miracles. The little things, what people overlook. Put it in the little basket. Take that with you. Take. You're missing the little things in your ministry. That's why everything's going bad for you. God's sending you all kinds of things, and you're, it's like you're standing on the shore in the middle of the night, and the boat goes by, and you don't see it. Most of the stuff fits in the little basket in life. Most people don't have giant miracles, six and seven a day. That's not going to happen. Is it? Yeah, I don't think so. These little ones happen all the time. Each one of the disciples, including Philip, got a basket. What's God trying to tell you? Hey, I got a basket for you. I got your ministry here. I got, I got your miracles here. Get a sack of lunch from a little kid if you have to. Put it in here. Where's your childlike faith? I, I don't need that. I got that covered. God doesn't have the childlike faith he needs covered. That's what you got to give him. He's got all the intellectual stuff, the Holy Ghost. He's the top of the line. The little stuff. Take your basket with you. Oh, man, I'm not going to take offenses anymore. What they say to me, I don't even care what they say to me anymore. What they think doesn't matter. It only matters what God thinks. Any little thing. See, it's not a Red Sea thing. It's, it goes in your basket. Oh, this is a big one. Training. Let's go to the map first, shall we? Okay. There's Bethany there. It's a, it's a couple of miles thereabouts from Jerusalem. East of there, heading toward the Red Sea. And then you see north of that, uh, here's the Jordan River, remember? And then here's... Uh, Jesus up here in Capernaum, that was his home. He moved from down here in Nazareth, and he moved to Capernaum, and he traveled constantly up and down the river to do missionary work, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, Bethany's over here. It's a couple-mile walk from Jerusalem, okay? And then it says, there was a certain man who was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. What are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at the sack lunch person, generally speaking, here. Then we're looking at kind of like Philip there, in a way. Not exactly, just a, just a thought. There in Bethany and Lazarus, uh, as you know, he got some kind of an illness. But it was Mary who anointed the Lord's feet with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, and though and her, her brother Lazarus was sick. Now, this, the reason that that family is highlighted here is because everybody knew that family. Everybody knew Lazarus. They knew Martha. They knew Mary. All the disciples knew them. They stopped there regularly, traveling from here to there. They'd go through Bethany. They stayed at Lazarus' house. Lazarus probably, I'm guessing, grew up with Jesus. They were the best of friends. So it was a natural, hey, Lord, you stay here when you're traveling. 
we'll feed everybody, we'll, we'll contribute, we'll do this, we'll do that. Lazarus was probably a wealthy guy, a successful man. So he would put them up. And they were close friends, and everybody could tell they were close friends. Anybody here have a close friend? Yeah, my grandpa said if you die and you can count your friends on one hand, you're like a, a walking miracle. But <clears throat> you can tell somebody who has a best friend over somebody who has a friend. There's a difference between a best friend and a friend. And you can tell they're which it is by watching that person's behavior. Yeah. They act differently toward a best friend than they do toward a friend. Yeah. My best yeah. <laughs> they act differently, correct? You can spot it, pretty easy. Well, they knew Jesus and Lazarus had a, some kind of a tight bonding, probably from growing up together. I don't know that. But something did it. And Mary was like the kid with the sack alone. She just had just enormous childlike faith. She was a lover, and she was fascinated by the things of God. Martha was too, but uh, she was much more intelligent than Mary, and she was a performance-based person. Performance-based persons, when they've got a good heart, are tremendous assets to ministries. You can't live without them, but the ones that, the ones that get their validation from their performance causes a major problem in the ministry because they start performing and then and then if they don't get the accolade or the affirm, affirmation they make sure somebody sees them doing it and so it kind of, the thing kind of leads down a bad road and martha was the type of person who was also a perfectionist she wanted everything done exactly right okay? mary let something go a little bit not Martha, she'd catch it, you know. No matter what you were wearing, eating, or going, she would spot it. She'd nitpick it, okay? Similar to a math teacher. You pick, and you, you've got to know exact, numbers don't lie. If the numbers go that way, see? And the math people tried to get out of that, and then they came up with new math, which is basically the old math, elongated and gone a totally different direction. You get to the same spot, but you got two miles there to get it. Mary is, oh, thank you, Jesus. Martha was, thank you, Jesus, but we got to get this stuff done. Get it done. See? She was a nitpicker. Oh, darn. Martha. Well, Lazarus got sick, and that traumatized everybody. Lazarus, I think, was a wealthy man, known everywhere. Everybody respected him. They were the famous house, famous household. And then when the Lord Jesus stayed there, it went off the chain. Oh, my God, the Savior goes to his house, not these other houses. Wow, can you imagine the rush on that? <clears throat> his sister sent someone to see Jesus, and, of course, Jesus wasn't there. He was near the Jordan River where... John the Baptist used to baptize people. So that was about a five-mile five jaunt, something like that, six, thereabouts, somewhere in that area. So they sent somebody to him, go find Jesus, Lazarus is sick. And they're so tight, they're so tight that as soon as he hears Lazarus is sick, he'll come a-running instantly, just like that, because it's Lazarus. It's not Ed down the street. Just, I'm not sure there was an Ed there, but if there was, it's not him. It's Lazarus. This is, yeah. these two are there. He'll come right away. No problem. We'll just send somebody to tell him. Tell him he's sick, real sick. He's dying, real, ready to die. Please come back and heal him, so on and so on. And when Jesus heard that he was sick, the Holy Ghost goes, hey, this is another teaching moment with a still small voice in your head. So he takes this, this uh, terminal illness Lazarus has got and turns it into training time. Yeah. That may happen to you someday. Someone you really care about, someone you really love gets sick and dies in spite of the fact that you offered 500,000 prayers for that person. 
You say, well, that never happens. You'd be surprised how many times that happens. You'd be shocked. But the person died and went home to heaven for a reason, and God was watching you think that through. He was planning something for you. Somebody died, and God allowed it to happen, but he watched you think your way through it. You follow me? Yeah. This guy's dying right now, and it's a teaching moment, and Jesus says, to us, this sickness doesn't lead to death. This thing's for the glory of God. And, by the way, my glory. Wow! How can you say something like that unless you're A, psychotic, or B, telling the truth? No in between. None in between. It's one or the other. Take your pick. I chose the latter myself. You, and hope you will. The Son of God is going to get glory out of this. Teaching moment. Isaiah chapter 42 said that it was a sin to give God's glory to any, anyone else. That was blasphemy, right? God will not share his glory with another. Correct? Yeah. Well, I made sure I got that covered when I went in the ministry in 2004. I got that covered. So everybody I prayed for that got healed, uh, the next statement was, I had nothing to do with that healing. Because I wasn't looking to get on TV. Hello? Yeah. I made sure that... I got that caveat in there that I entered a disclaimer on it to make sure nobody thought I had anything to do with it, which I never have. Here it is. The Son of God gets the glory, but only the Lord is allowed to take glory. So there must be a connection there. <laughs> he must be the Lord, the way I read it. Now, here's what it says about Jesus. Now, Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, right? Agapao is a Greek word for love. What's the, what's the uh, noun for love? Agape, thank you. <clears throat> Agapao, as you know, is the verb for love, so that means uh, you show love to someone. So, if I say I love you, that is not going to do you any good. But if I agapao, show you love, now that's different. So you got to get your love to the person. Love does, love's not good without getting it. To, see, for God so loved the world that he gave, so he got it to you. See that? So they said, Jesus showed his love to these three people, and everybody could see it. Oh my gosh, he loves you. You can tell when somebody loves somebody, can't you? Right? I mean, I went to the Arrowhead Mall a few days ago, and, you know, I got a confession to make. Uh, I, I do not, I'm not madly in love with the shoppers at that mall. And so, as I was walking down the Stores and you could tell by watching me, I'm carrying Lexi in this pouch thing, that I do not massively love these people walking by me because I was just walking. You know, I wasn't, there was no agapao, I wasn't showing anybody any love. Okay. Wives are very sensitive to this with husbands. Hey, uh, do you love me? I told you I loved you last week. Okay, well, that's the, what they were really meant to say, the wife, and the wife can't put it, you know, can't put it where it's productive. What they really meant was you're not showing, you're, you're not showing enough love to me. You told me you love me, and that's fine, but you're not showing it. Yeah. 
as grand, my granddad used to tell me, uh, there's nothing greater than, than your kids, and there's nothing more miserable than your neighbor's kids. You show your love to your kids, is what he was saying, you know, in his own gruff, rough way. But you're not showing it to your neighbor's kids. It's, I'm, I'm just stating the obvious here. He says, I show my love for these people, and everybody knew they loved him because they watched him. When he heard he was sick, he decided, hey, this is a teaching moment. I'm not going. I'm staying here. Well, that bucked the whole system, see? What you got to understand about your Christian life, and the reason it stinks so bad, is because God is trying to train you that when you think things should go this way and they don't, he still got it covered. Everybody would have bet every nickel on that horse that he would have bolted for Bethany because he was only four, three, three and a half, four miles away. He was over by the Jordan River, it says. Right? Everybody had money on that horse. He didn't move. Some of you got discouraged. I understand. I've been there. I thought it should have gone this way. This is how I prayed. And I asked God to do it that way. I thought it was, it looked like it was going to go that way. And then all of a sudden, it stopped. See, had you reached out with a sack of lunch, you'd have got your miracle handed to you on a silver platter. But because you filled your depends, the miracle got blocked. Why? He's watching you think about how he's testing you. He's watching you think. He sees you thinking. He wants to see how you're going to collate this unexpected event. Things didn't go the way I thought they would. I thought they were going that way. But the bottom fell out of it. He's watching you react to it. He sees how you think. He said, well, I'm going to hang around here a couple days. I got a plan in mind that he's screaming to you about right now. I got a plan in mind you don't understand. And you will never see it fulfilled in your life if you don't keep on believing. It's not going to happen. They didn't know what he was doing. They didn't know he was about to die. They just assumed he would leave like that. Because he was his best friend, or one of them. They were like that. It's happened to you many times over the years. You failed your test. You panicked. Let not your heart be troubled. You got troubled when it you thought it was going to go that way, and it went that way. Emotionally, you were hurt. He panicked. Holy shoot. Oh, no. I'm going to hang for two days. The disciples are sitting around. They're not saying anything to him, but they're like church people. They talk about it on the side. Everybody talking. Why is he staying here? Well, they have, a, they have a tiff? Well, they break up? There's all kinds of theories. That's what churches are about. They're chronic theories on everything. They have a theory on every subject. He stayed two days in the same place. He didn't move. Stayed right there near the river. After two days, he says, listen, uh, let's go down to Judea. Again, okay, flip back to chapter 10 in John, and the Jews were trying to stone him. Yeah. Well, yeah. 
he had told them some amazing things and they got so pissed off it was frightening they wanted to stone him right there John chapter 10 a thief comes to steal and kill and destroy John 10 right so now he says let's go back there what's God trying to tell you listen your comfort zone is ruining your life okay and if the Holy Ghost can't get you out of your comfort zone you will miss your destiny you will die a spiritual failure your comfort zone is a cancer to you He wants to go back where they're going to stone us? Whoa, now anxiety sweeps through the disciples. Their hearts are now troubled. Uh-oh, this isn't going the way I thought it was. What are we going back there again for? The disciples said, hey, Master, the Jews tried to kill you. You're going back there again. Once again, things of faith can't be figured out with human intelligence. Okay? You got a high IQ, that's like a cancer when it's improperly managed. Very smart people are incredibly stupid. <laughs> what did he just say? Intelligence used inappropriately is a serious deficit to your life. You go in there again, they're thinking. That doesn't make sense. Common sense would tell you, stay here. The disciples were glad when he stayed there two days. Aren't there 12 hours in a day, the Lord said? If you walk in the day, you won't stumble because they see the light of the world. What's he talking about, the sun? No. And talk about himself again. <laughs> it, Philip, buddy, if you've seen me, you've seen God. If you walk in the light, me, you win. If you walk in the night, you'll stumble. Because there's no light where? In you. In you. <laughs> See, when you get born again, the Holy Ghost comes into your spirit, man. He lives in here now. You are now his house. Correct? Well, Lord, shall we worship here or there? Woman, the day is coming when you will not be worshiping at Gerizim's temple or in the temple in Jerusalem. God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. He seeks such to worship him. How do you do that? It comes from in here. Inside. Your spirit, man. That's how it works. See that? If you walk in the night, you stumble because there's no what? There's no light in you. The light is not the sun. It's not these lights. This is the light. Our friend, our friend, all the disciples knew that family. They were all friends. Mary, Martha, they were, everybody's on a first name basis in that family. That was their extended family, if you will. Our friend. Jesus ain't just not my friend. He's your friend. All you guys. He's your friend. He's sleeping. What's God telling you? Hey, you can be spiritually dead and asleep while you're still alive. People who die are actually sleeping because they're not really dead. People who die are sleeping, they're not really dead. They're still alive. 
The question is, where are they? Are they in heaven or are they in hell? When you die, you're more awake than you ever were in this life. You know why? The body's gone and there's no buffer anymore. Everything that felt good is now magnified a million times. Everything that has pain is magnified a million times. People in hell scream in hellish agony. People in heaven are in glory and they can't believe it. Why? No body. No buffer anymore. He's sleeping. His disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, they thought he meant taking a nap or something. He was sick, he needed to get some rest. He's doing great. Great. Sleeping. Good. What's he doing there? God sends Christians messages and they miss it. They're not getting it. You went through it a hundred times over the years. Well, I thought God told me to marry him. He seemed he was funny. God, I thought God told me to go to that church and they all laid hands on me and I left with Kundalini. I thought, see you, are you, are you following me? You, they thought. I've taught this 50,000 times over the years. The demons try to control human beings through their thoughts. They put thoughts in your mind. <clears throat> oh, the devil's powerful, man. He's got all the politicians. He's got voodoo, witchcraft. No, that, that's nothing compared to his real skill, putting thoughts in your mind. That's his real skill. In Revelation, he's called the deceiver of the whole world. Well, how does he do that? Stand on a corner with a sign? No. He controls people through their minds. Well, we thought he was talking about taking, we thought a nap. A we thought that was a good. Mercy. Gives you another shot. Your Christian life stinks. There's mercy waiting for you right here tonight. He says to him, Lazarus is dead. Spiritually dead? No. He was wide awake. Physically dead. Humans never die. But their bodies die. Okay? Cockroaches, insects, fish, animals, mammals, plants, insects, all die. They don't exist anymore. Humans never die. <clears throat> he said, I'm glad for your sake I wasn't there. Why? Because I wouldn't have had this chance to teach the people at the Deliverance Center 2,000 years from now is what he was thinking. I think. I think he was thinking that. He, he said, I'm glad I wasn't there so I could help you right now. Things are never, things are often, th things are occasionally not as they appear to be. And if you rely on your own thinking, in your own thought process, you will never find your destiny. You will never be delivered. You will never be healed. This isn't jeopardy. This is spiritual. I'm glad I wasn't there when he died. What? I didn't expect you here to say that. You guys were your best of friends. What do you, well, that's quite a statement. What he could have said was, I'm glad he wasn't there because 
I love you. And I need you to launch this church on the day of Pentecost so that somebody like Brother Mike can get saved 2,000 years from now. That's what I need you to do. That's what I want you to do. I'm glad I wasn't there for Brother Mike. Yeah. Somebody like Brother Mike gets scooped out of the bottom of the trash can 2,000 years from now. I'm glad I wasn't there. Why? So you would do what? Believe. Not like Philip and overanalyze it and think it out and nitpick it out. No, nope, that's going to that's gonna get you nowhere. Not like Thomas doubting it. Oh, that can't happen. Oh, no. Come on. Come on, man. No, not like that. I want you to learn to believe. When things don't go your way, when it doesn't appear to make sense, when you can't make heads or tails out of it, I want you to know something. I've got you covered. I thought it out for you. Talking about mercy here. Oh, Thomas pipes up. Oh, I know one of those church people. You know what? They're sitting around in Sunday school glad they haven't said anything. I got to say something so people think I'm spiritual. Whoa! And they pop out with a deep spiritual event that comes out of their mouth. Blah! Thomas does it again. I can't let these people think I'm a loser. I wanted to stay here. I'm scared to death, but let me, let me cap this one. Let's go with him so we may die with him. He's looking around to see if everybody thinks he's Superman. He didn't believe one word of what he said. Literally not one word. Guy was a doubting fraud. Lord, you going back there? They tried to stone you. Well, let's go back there with him. We'll get killed. Come on, man. Come on, Thomas. Thomas been hitting the wine. <laughs> Philip looked over at him with, oh, man. Come on, Tom. Oh, not again. You know, he had that figured out in two seconds. That was a church deal. Praise the Lord, brother. Hallelujah. Bunch of church crap. Well, they take, the, they take the trip, and it's not, it doesn't take that long. You know, we're looking at a day here, maybe, or a bunch of, you know, a portion of a day, whatever it is. He gets there, and this is day four now, right? We're on day four, and uh, they had put him away. He'd been dead four days. And uh, <clears throat> here's what the Jews did. Er, in early, early on in Genesis 50, they had what they called the days of weeping, or a period of mourning when somebody died, right? So it would go seven days. And uh, the rabbis back then taught that the spirit left the dead body, but it hung around the sepulcher for three days trying to get back in the body. This is what they taught. Then on the fourth day, when the body began to decompose, the rabbis said, oh, it's too late, the spirit left. Now it's over. So then the family would finish up the seven days of mourning. Four, five, six, seven. They call them the days of weeping. And nowadays, they call them the Shiva. And uh, Hamas killed like, what, 1,400? How many? 15? I don't remember. I think it was around 1,400. So they've had all kinds of Shivas over in Israel since that attack was it a year or two ago? I don't have time. I don't do well with time anymore. But anyway, I think it was a year or two ago. 1,400 people died. The Shiva, and the, what the Jews do, they cover all the mirrors in their house as a symbolic gesture of focusing on this dead person. And then they don't sit in like regular chairs. They sit in small chairs showing that they're showing respect to the person that's dead, the Shiva. But anyway, it was different when Jesus was alive. Now it's, now it's changed. Okay, so back to Bethany. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs. That was about 0.13 of a mile. It's about two miles, thereabouts, approximately. Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them. Well, that was in the Old Testament. Jehovah required that if somebody uh, died, 
you were to pro provide comfort for the family. Now, when Jesus was alive, uh, the uh, synagogue, if you were a poor person like Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus died, he was homeless. So the synagogue, if somebody died and they didn't have a family and they had no money and they were homeless or something like that, the synagogue would provide a mourner for that person. So they would have one mourner when they were buried, if they were poor. So everybody got at least one mourner. Well, here, uh, Lazarus was popular, wealthy, and everything else. He got a crowd of mourners. This guy was a, a big shot. And John 11 again, Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, so somebody must have run ahead and told him. Probably somebody that cared about the family, probably trying to say, hey, I got good news for you. You know, he screwed up because he didn't come right away. He wasted two days, but he's finally here now. And Mary was in the house, but Martha then said, ran out to meet him, and she said, Lord, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now you can see your Christian life melting in front of you and how you could have fixed it so easily. Things are not going to go the way you think they're going to go all the time. It's not going to go your way all the time. When that happens, God's going to sit there and listen to you think. How are they processing this? What's their attitude? Martha's attitude and, the peop and Mary's attitude was, he let us down. I just gave you divine revelation. I just summarized hundreds of your prayers over the years. You've had a parts and points in your life where you said, God, let me down. That can happen to anybody. How do I know that? Because Mary and Martha were powerful Christians, very strong believers. And the demons tricked them. They put the thought in their mind, he let you down. And they believed it. They went through all the options. What are the options? They went through it. You would have too. My gosh, we're best of friends. Oh, my God. We've opened our home to him 500 times. We've fed him and the disciples over him. We love him. We have given him top-notch treatment. We've cared for him. We've, we've served him. We, we served in church. We, we did served the homeless. We, we fed everybody. We helped everybody. We were doing everything at the church. We did everything that was good. We served God and we loved God. They went through the process and then came to the horrible conclusion. Oh, my God. He let us down. It can't be. We've known him for three or four years. Lazarus grew up with him. What? How, could, how could he let us down? How? If you'd have just been here. That's how you do your healings, right, Lord? I've seen you do it. Yeah, we've seen you heal multitudes of people. You're there. The people are getting here or there. See, what God's trying to tell you is you can replace your Mickey Mouse Christian life. You will adjust your thinking. You may have learned it this way before, but God has another way for you to go that you didn't know existed. And when you didn't go down that road, the door shut. The demon shot it. Bang. Hey, everything you said about me was right. Yeah. We, I, he was my best friend. I, you fed me a thousand times. You did this in church. You did that in church. Oh, you're the worship leader. Oh, you sing and play an instrument in church. You give to the homeless. You fit. I, I saw all that. I got it. But 
You've never been down this road. I want you down there now. Oh, wow. I just gave you the best news in the world. That means God's got something else for you that you're not aware of. Lord, if you'd just been here, okay, this is how you do it. I know I've watched you. This is how we've got it set up in our mind. This is how it works. I know how it works. Do you really know how it works? Ah, oh, you'll be surprised. Father has something that you're not aware of that also works. And so based on our analysis, you let us down. Some of P Philip's demons got into him. Hey, why don't you analyze this thing? Put your IQ on it. Oops. No. But... Martha was a powerful woman of God. She wasn't a heathen. Far from it. I know you. I know you. I've seen you. Numerous times. I watched you heal people with my own eyes. When you talk to God, he'll give it to you. I know you. I've seen you do it. Jesus said, hey, I got some good news for you. This is all a training program for the Deliverance Center 2,000 years from now. Here's what's going to happen. Lazarus will rise again. Well, no, wait a minute. Uh-oh. Philip clicks in her mind again. Click. Oh, that you're talking about the rapture at the end. Okay, got it. Oh, I know he'll rise again then. See? The devil kicks Christians' faces in so easily. You know why? Because he tells them they've got it figured out. You got spiritual things figured out. You're doing great. That's the one thing Christians don't know about the devil. He can be very complimentary. He'll tell you you're on your game and doing great. Oh, your, your spiritual knowledge is deep. Martha fell for it. She said, oh, I know he's going to rise again. I know all about it. I heard you teach on the resurrection. I got that. We were listening because we're strong Christians. We love you. We follow. I got it. Wait a minute. That was then that I taught you about the resurrection, the second coming, the rapture, and all that stuff. But there are other resurrections I didn't teach you about. Martha, honey, you, you nitpicker. The devil came to Martha and said, Martha, honey, you, you're a very intelligent person. You've got your game on. you got this resurrection business in the bag. Sometimes the biggest blessing in life is when God throws you a curve. There's another resurrection, Martha. You didn't talk about that. You didn't hear about that. I know about it. Anastasis, what does that mean? I just got resurrected. It means to stand up or get up. <laughs> now that I'm here, I think I'll finish up the seminar here. But Ah, the resurrection. You go up. Now it's just the rising, the standing. Yeah. 
That's where you're headed, thank God. But it's not now, it's then. But Martha said, wait a minute. You mean, you mean I, I don't know everything about the resurrection? You know the most powerful Christians in the long run are the ones that understand they never know everything. Those are the ones that never stop growing. They're always learning. You believe that? Most Christians don't want anything to do with that. They want to understand this. I got it down pat. I'm fine. Those are the idiots. The ones that grow are the ones that are, hey, wait a minute. I don't know everything about that. There's got to be more to that. I'm going to let God test me with a circumstance I'm not fully understanding so I can grow more. Before you li read, leave tonight, I took a copy of this for you. The greatest verse in the Bible, Old or New Testament, is on the screen now. Here's a copy of it if you want one. I'll just leave it here for you if you're interested, but if you're not, that's fine. I am the resurrection and the life. Wait a minute, I hadn't heard. Oh, hold on a minute. He just busted the bank. That's, that's a new teaching. Okay, so now Martha's having what, what they say on the street, brain farts. Click, click, this isn't registered. Click, click, that's not registering. Click, click. I learned about the resurrection. I learned about the right one. I, but this, what do you mean? What do you, Sometimes God will move you out of your comfort zone spiritually. Why is he doing that? He's trying to get you to go from this level to that one. And he's relentless. He's relentless. Love is relentless. So he throws you a curveball. You knew everything about resurrection, did you, Martha? Yes, I do. No, I didn't tell you about all the resurrection. There's another one. He went like that while he was talking to her. There's another one. Greatest verse in the Bible. There it is. The bullseye of Scripture. She said, uh-oh, man, I got to get out of here. Okay, Lord, I, I believe you're the Son of God that should come into the world. She's trying to recover here. Listen, <clears throat> it's easy to spot Christians who are kind of sick because if you give them some information that kind of upsets their apple cart, they start having a, they start having a seizure. Well, that's not where I was taught. Well, Martha's having that Comfort zone thing shattered here. She goes, oh, wait a minute. No, no, I'm going to, I got a rebound here. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. She's right. She's rebounding, and then she does what? She runs for it. <clears throat> Goodbye. She says, I'll let Mary handle this from on, here on in. I got to go. I got to get back to the house to make sure this is right, and that's right, and this rights, and that right. See, when God moves some people out of their comfort zone, they'll bolt, and they'll run back to what they know. Because getting out of your comfort zone is an opportunity that exists only for people who are not cowards. Cowards are the only ones who get in their comfort zone and stay there. Great moves of God come from people who step out of their comfort zone. I gotta get back to work. Mary, come here, I wanna talk to you. So they go into the closet there at the house Listen, 
He's calling for you. Well, Mary is not a Philip. As soon as she heard that, she bolts. She bolts. She runs to Jesus. Jesus is outside of Bethany. He hadn't come into the town yet. And there, he stayed. Why didn't he go in? You know, What's he doing here? Well, he wasn't through training the sisters. There was a second sister. I tried to push the other one out of the comfort zone. I failed. Now I'll try the other sister. I got some bad news for you. I'm not trying to be cruel, but so many people in this world have missed out on their ministries and their ministry kind of moved on. Why? They wouldn't step out. It's a little shaky out here, but I'm going to pray through this. I'm going to Hang on, I'm going to reach out. I'm a little nervous, but I'm going to stay right here. Do that. Most Christians won't do that. They'll stay. It's comfortable here. I'm going to go to church. I'll see my friends. Hallelujah. Bless your brother. <laughs> to see a move of God, somebody's going to have to get out of that zone. You can't live in that zone and see the Holy Ghost move. You got to get out of your comfort zone. Well, Mary bolts. She goes, hey, she goes running right out to him. I mean, like, I mean, Hussein bolt, boom. She's running fast. The Jews saw her bolt out of the house. So they knew she wasn't going to Fry's. She wouldn't run to Fry's. Nobody in their right mind runs to Fry's. Some people look at the prices and run out of fries, but they said, man, she's bolting. There she goes, Carl Lewis. Get her! They knew she was going somewhere. So they follow her. They leap up. They got out of their comfort zone. They said, what? Well, hey, we've been in a morning enough now, you know. This morning thing was really interesting in Judaism. A lot of the mourners were paid. You had the hardcore mourners here, the family members and people really cared. And then rich people would hire other mourners. So they would have hired mourners in the house. For example, Brother Jarius gets back to his house. He's the ruler of the synagogue. His daughter just died on him. And the, Jesus walks in the door and says, Hey, I'm going to test you people. She's not dead, she's sleeping. He used the same one on that family. Sleep. The mourners who were weep, weeping, crying, and wailing suddenly start laughing because those were the paid ones. You're just a paid mourner. Oh, no. Oh, Lord. Uh, hi. I just did it. I just mourning, and then I just snapped out of it. It's like a politician. Oh, my God, I can't believe these people are hurting. <laughs> yeah, yuck, yuck, yuck. They're paid, Jack. Paid mourners. It's all for show. Mary, he's, Mary runs and says, hey, she's going to the grave to weep. Greek word, klio, which means to wail, cry like, Huge, have a crying jag, clio. And it says, when Mary came where Jesus was, she fell down at his feet. Martha didn't do that. Notice that? See, they're both powerful Christians. They're both good women of God. They both love the Lord. But Mary, Mary had that Holy Ghost thing, that sensitivity thing. See, most people don't have that. She had the sensitivity thing to things of the Spirit. Martha didn't fall. She fell. Notice that? What's God telling you? Hey, to get into the Holy of Holies, 
You can't be like Martha and get back to what you got to do at the house. You got to be able to fall. People think the Holy Ghost is running around heaven. He's not. He's down here waiting for you. Right down here. Well, I can't do that. That's embarrassing. People are going to look at me and go, God's waiting for you to step out of your social comfort zone and turn around and have somebody hose that yellow streak off your back and boom. Unfortunately, Mary, who had been indoctrinated by the people at the house and the Jews at the house, repeated the same thing Martha did. <clears throat> Why does God require you to renew your mind? Because the devil always tracks you with losers. He has them follow you. They say negative things. They say things that make you doubt. They say things that make you question things. They say confusing things. Mary and Martha brainwashed. He let us down. He let us down. That's what everybody in the house says. See, God's looking for you to break out of the pack. Anybody can go with the crowd. Any gutless loser, any yellow-bellied, sap-sucking Christian can go with the crowd. Anybody can do it. It takes no skill whatsoever to break out of the crowd. Requires courage. If you listen to these people, you're going to end up with nothing in life. Nothing. The devil will always send you somebody to say something negative to you. Always. Relatives, brothers, sisters, parents, mother, dad, doesn't matter. People at work. Church. Happens all the time at church. Somebody will walk up to you and say the stupidest thing you've ever heard. Why? To indoctrinate you like Mary had been indoctrinated. She was so tender for God. But the mind is different than the spirit, man. Your mind will betray you. Lord, had you just been there? That's what everybody says. We know how you do miracles. We've been watching you for three years now. Sir, we got it right there. This is how you do it. See, God's trying to tell you that if you want to progress spiritually, you got to be able to do some things that you haven't done before. That you thought didn't work. You assumed things. You thought things. Now you got to change. You let us down, Lord. Oh, I love you. You let us down. See, I'm down here. Remember, it said Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He's not criticizing them, is he? No, he's trying to teach them. He's testing them. Hey, I'm showing you your comfort zones over here. I want you to come over here. I want you to do what Brother Jarius did when he panicked. He looked at the Lord and said, oh, my God, my daughter just died. The church just came and told me my daughter's dead. Oh my God, he looks over at Jesus. He says, keep on believing. There's a resurrection you don't know about. I told Martha and Mary about it today. I never told them about it before. There's another resurrection. You don't know everything. God can work with Christians who don't know everything. Those are the ones he likes the best. The ones that think they know things, they usually get nothing. Nothing.
when Jesus saw her wailing, Clio, she was having a crying jag. And then it says the Jews came by, they were wailing. They're all wailing. All of a sudden, everybody, everybody around him is wailing. Now total chaos broke out. Everything was calm until Mary got there. Mary made a false statement. You let us down. Then the Jews said, yeah, you let her down. Everybody's in agreement. We're all on the same page. You screwed up. You let her down. You stayed there two days. We're all sick over it. And Jesus groaned in his spirit. Oh boy, this, is, this part's really interesting. Imbrimaomai means to snort like a horse. <sighs> like somebody's getting steamed. Now why? Why would that happen? This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. This is crazy. Instead of Jesus weeping with him, the Bible says to weep with those who weep and laugh with those who laugh. He's getting fussy. Sure, he gets fussy when you won't step out of your comfort zone. You stay there for years doing the same crappy thing over and over. <clears throat> He looked around, everybody wailing, nobody believing. Oh, that hurts God. Oh, man, that grieves the Holy Ghost. It hurts him when believers don't believe. That really gets him. Tarasso, agitated. Oh, he's starting to get steamed. Well, that's insensitive. He was an insensitive person. Everybody's crying and wailing. No. He saw that the devil had taken over the funeral parlor. When the devil takes over someplace, it hacks him off. Particularly your mind. He's agitated. Tarasso, oh, man, he's getting a little steamed here. Now, here's the Greek words translated weeping, and it gives a, you know, kind of a bad uh, translation. This is the one used there, klio, which means to pitch a fit and wail and cry, you know, like wild crying. A kruo is one where you're just shedding tears. Okay, how about a pop quiz? When Jesus stood over on the mount and looked over the city of Jerusalem, it says he what? He wept over the city. Remember that? Which, were the, which term was used? That one or this one? That's correct. This one. Jesus was having a crying jag. You believe that? Jesus goes to the grave here in just a minute. And it says, the shortest verse in the Bible was? Which one was that? This one. He wept and shed a few tears over Jerusalem, knowing the Romans were coming. He had a crying, heaving fit. What did that mean? Father was having a crying, heaving fit because the Jews were all going to die. 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and murdered everybody. He was wailing over it. Made him sick to his stomach. Jesus said, oh, I got to get out of this total confusion and this massive wave of unbelief. I can't take it anymore. Where's he at? Well, Lord, come and see. Okay, I will. There it is. He just shed a few tears looking around. He was so sad that Lazarus died. It was, he was just sick over it. <laughs> of course he wasn't. He was weeping over these people who had no faith. That's what killed him. 
He was weeping over the sin of the world that causes people to die because of Adam and Eve. He was weeping over all the sadness and sorrow of humanity. It hit him right there. Wow. This is awful. The Jews go, what? Look. They didn't lose, use the Greek word agapao, did they? No, they used phileo. Look how fond he was of him. He liked him so much. See, he's shedding a few tears. We can tell by looking at him that he really was fond of this guy. See that? That's the Jews looking at him. Look how he liked him so much. Some of them said, again, the demons were telling him to make a statement of faith. See, the devil gives Christians faith statements. And they're totally stupid. This statement here actually is saying, you know, I don't know. I don't think he could have pulled this one off. You think he could have? You think he might have done that? Uh -uh, well, let me think about it. Had that kid in the sack lunch been around, doggone it, we couldn't find him again. He would have been right there at the Lazarus door saying, hey, move that stone out of the way. I got sack lunch to feed him. Philip's in there going, oh, hey, well, wait a minute here. Let's think about this. Let me think about it. You stay in your comfort zone and suffer. That's all you think about. Do you think he could have, could that have, that's actually a statement of unbelief, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think he could have done it? That would have been a fair question to ask me. Do you think Mike could have pulled that off? Well, I would have had to tell him, I don't, I don't, I don't have it. Saying that about him, that was a statement of unbelief. They should have said, of course he can, of course he would have done that. Absolutely. Stupid. That's Arabic. But Jesus, again, groaning in himself. There it is again. He's, <laughs> he already had his little weep over the sin of the world there. Now he's, boom, mad. What are you getting mad at the grave for, Jesus? Well, you don't have a lot of sympathy for these people. No, he's trying to save them. But he's really trying to save us. He comes to the grave, and it was a spalion. What is that? A grotto where rich people get buried. You go in, you roll this big stone over. That's where Jesus was buried, in a tomb similar to this one. You go in there, and there's uh, the director of the IRS there. Then there's, uh, you know, Apple CEO there. Rich guy here, rich guy there. Grotto there, rich there. And there's, click, Lazarus, big deal. He goes in here. Pay him there. Roll it over. Jesus was in a grotto, but there was only one person in the grotto. It, was, it had never been used before. Remember? He was in a new land. Lazarus in there with the group. Well, he had his he wept over the people and then. Jesus barks out, take that stone away. Martha, again, people who, who see their value in life because of how they perform and how they're perceived during their performance usually end up bankrupt spiritually. Martha said, wait a minute, whoa, hold on, whoa, hold on a minute. This is a, let me nitpick this thing for a minute here. He's in there, he's decaying, the stone looks good where it is. That was a nice fit there for the stone. He's been laid in there next to Bob, the CEO from the synagogue. They're all lined up nice and neat. Everything's all perfect. We fixed everything. Martha saw to it. Everything great in the sepulcher. Perfect. Whoa, hold on a minute. Jesus, let me give you some information that you don't need. Most Christians end up losers because they want to give God the information instead of receiving it from Him. 
yeah, this is my area. I feel comfortable in this area. Here's why. Let me tell you all about it. Blah, 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 blah. You idiot. Step out. Make a move. Now, wait a minute. Are you sure? He stinks. Fourth day. The spirit left the body. He's not in there anymore. Fourth day. Seventh day. Seven days of the morning. So he stinks. Jesus said, Martha, honey, didn't I, do I need to remind you of this? Wasn't I talking about the glory back outside of town there? Remember that? We had that conversation. Remember that conversation? Yeah, I remember that. Martha remembered everything. She had everything, every dot, every T. What's he doing here? He's pushing Martha out of her comfort zone there. He wants her to become a super-powered saint at the day of Pentecost and healing and winning souls. And she was, he was pushing. He knew Mary would be there, but he needed to get Martha straightened out. How am I doing? Am I doing a good job? Do you like me? You know, it's a Sally Field syndrome. You like me. You really like me. Do you like me? How am I doing tonight? Do you like white? I know you do. You, makes you think of angels, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm killing this thing. You idiot, it's not about your, what you're doing in your performance. That's not your value. Your value is you have the Holy Ghost. You've been washed in the blood. That's your value. Thank you, Jesus. Martha, I told you we went over this, remember? Was he reaming around? No. Grace and mercy comes to you tonight again to try to get you to step out of that area he's trying to evict you because the devil got you walled in over here he's he walled you in and then he gave you a bunch of compliments now you're smart you're doing great your bible studies are fabulous oh you're the way you play at church you're doing oh your singing is great oh look at that and the person never knows they're walled in, living the life of a spiritual loser. He's smarter than we are, folks. He hadn't noticed that. They took away the stone. Anyway, somebody had half a brain and did what he said. Is that you tonight? Are you going to stop nitpicking stuff, questioning it, philippizing it, and just do it. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Don't try to figure it out. Whatever he tells you to do, fill up the water pots. Fill them up to the brim. Don't ask why. Do it. That's your problem. You ask why. You, you try to nitpick it like Martha. You listen to other people say negative things like, Mary, nothing's going to go your way if you don't change. What's he doing now? He's teaching. Here he goes. Here he goes again. Now he ignores everybody. There it is. A few days later, there'd be another stone turned away. A roll of that stone. But that's for the preliminary stone, not the main one. Roll that stone away. Now he, go, he looks this way. As soon as the stone moved, then he goes here. Father, thank you for hearing me. I always know you hear me. You hear me all the time. Oh, man. Can you grasp that vision? And I, can't you take it for yourself? It's scriptural. Every time you pray, even if it's a stupid prayer, he heard you. He hears you. He always hears you. Even if you're like Brother James, you pray amiss. Hey, grace covers it. 
He'll come right back to you and try and get you out of your comfort zone. Hey, have you thought about going that way? Ooh, I don't know. Come here. I mean, take a step. Ooh, do I need to talk to that person? Do I need to apologize to that person? Ugh, boy, that's... Ugh, okay. Last night, I uh, had a deliverance training class on Zoom with a church uh, in Ohio, I think it was. Could have been Alabama. <laughs> but so anyway, the pastor's there, pastor's wife's there on the Zoom. And there's about, I don't know, 10 people on there. They're trying to start a del deliverance program in their church. So they wanted me to give a little spiel. So last night, I give them a spiel. And then uh, I got tired of giving, giving spiels. So I just picked this lady out on the Zoom right there, that lady. Her name was uh, Carol. I said, Carol. And I told her, you know, some stuff about herself. Well, then she starts, she's, she, she starts opening up, you know. She was over here in her comfort zone on the Zoom because there was other, a bunch of other people on the Zoom. And so I just kind of kept nudging her. And, you know, then she finally kind of put her toe out. And she said, uh, you know, I've been having some depression and I've been down. Uh, my uh, 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 daughter-in-law and my son and my daughter-in-law moved and they took my granddaughter, the little girl, and this woman, Carol, was madly in love with the granddaughter. And so they moved. So she's going through this period of depression. <clears throat> well, I knew something else was up. I knew it, something, something that didn't look right here. So I kept petering around with her and she coughed it up. <clears throat> the daughter-in-law doesn't like her and would keep the granddaughter from her. And she was getting stabbed in the soul. And I said to the group, I said, well, you see, the, see what happened here? She wasn't telling me that initially, but as I kind of put it around with her, asking some few more questions. Boop, that thing popped out. Well, that was God helping us. The good Lord had that, that thing popped right out. I caught it. So what do we got to do? We got we to forgive that daughter-in-law. Huge. And we got to put the Lord ahead of the grandbaby. Huh? Sometimes you push them out of their comfort zone, and it works. Boom. Stephanie was on the call with me. The demons started flying out of that woman. She didn't move initially because there were other people watching on the Zoom. Felt uncomfortable. Yeah. And kind of... Imagine her. She got healed. Why well, did to get off? I had another appointment. Well, Stephanie took over, and then apparently everybody on the Zoom got delivered. I mean, when Stephanie shows up, everybody gets delivered, I guess. Why? I know you always hear my prayer. Every time I pray, I know you hear me. I know it. And sometimes you answer my prayers in a way I don't understand or I don't like or I don't agree with. But you're doing that out of love because you want me to get out of this 
neighborhood and move into the next one. See, sometimes the Holy Ghost wants you to be George Jefferson. See, you got to move on up to the penthouse. The Holy Ghost has got a penthouse for you. And George Jefferson left the outhouse and went up to the penthouse. I'm not talking to you right now because I need any affirmations. I'm not like Martha. I'm saying this because these people are listening to me. Everything we went over tonight, he said, because you're listening to him. I want them to know you sent me. I don't care what you think. This is, good. this is good teaching here. When he has spoken that prayer, and there's a short one. You don't need long prayers. Okay. He cried with a loud voice. Godzo means yelling. He started yelling, Lazarus, come out. Why do you do that? Because he was in a grotto, and if he just said, come out, all eight or nine of these guys would have leaped out of the Everybody had been walking out. Look, it looked like a blue light special at Kmart. Everybody lined up. All of them. Re no, he just wanted one resurrection. Lazarus. So he had to name him to come out. If that makes any sense. He was in a grotto. He yelled it out. Screamed it out. There it is. Why? Because... He likes yelling. No, he was, everybody was listening to him. What was he doing to you? He's teaching you to call out. Call it out. Satan, I command you in the name of Jesus. Take your filthy hands off my daughter and my son. Take your hands off my body. I command you to come out of my mind. Come out. Crowd God's own. Well, Brother Mike, could you pray for me? I said, yeah, I'll pray for you, but come on, let's step up here. Step out and go. No offense, but you're not getting any younger. He that was dead, physically dead, came forth bound hand and foot with grave claws. His face was bound with a what? Sudarian. When's the next one of those pop up? <laughs> well, Peter and John run to the tomb. They don't believe Mary. This is another Mary. They don't believe her. He's risen. So they run back to the tomb. And they run inside there. They're looking around. And, not this tomb, the real tomb. And they see these grave claws they had wrapped Jesus in. They're all messed up. And it kind of looked like, in a way, somebody just lifted out of them. <laughs> but over there, folded up nice and neat, was a message for the devil. Somebody left the devil a message because he knew he'd come back to that tomb and peek in there and find out what was going on in there. And then when he saw that Sudarian all folded up nice and neat, he left that for him. Right there, the devil filled his pants, collapsed in fear. Why? His power over you was broken at that moment. I'll leave that for another visitor, not a human one. There it is, a Sudarian. They wrap your head in it.
God's talking to you tonight. It couldn't be any clearer. I can't top this. Loose her and let her go. Loose him and let him go. Step out. I know you always hear me. I know you always hear me. Well, let's pray then.